If anything that had less involvement with humans was better. I mean, we did kind of want to lean towards capital intensive businesses as opposed to labor intensive. But from my perspective, any business that has a lot of human capital involved has a higher risk of some sort of going really wrong post acquisition. How are you? Good. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you as well. Thanks for uh, reaching out and uh, putting me on here. I appreciate it. Oh, man, Twitter is an amazing place. I've met a lot of interesting people it's unbelievable honestly like it, it it doesn't seem real like every every few weeks like someone reaches out and i'm like i literally wouldn't have met this person for another 20 years if it wasn't for this platform so let's dive right into it tell me a little bit about yourself and uh what you've been up to it looks like you've started a few different companies and uh now you own like a hundred or hundreds of atm machines that you write about on twitter um, in a ton yep. of detail, which is super interesting. Um, give me a little bit about like your background and what you've been up to till now. Well, when you reached out, I started to listen to some of your uh, interviews on YouTube, and I heard that you're uh, you're part of a Russian family. So I uh, just want to let you know I was born into a family of Russian immigrants as well. So that was uh, that was a cool little thing. But I, um, yeah, I was actually born there, <coughs> born in the Soviet Union, and oh, cool. Uh, technically, the Ukraine, but I always say I'm Russian. Because it was right on the border. Okay, what, how, it was all the same thing back then. How old? How old were you when you uh, when you got here? I was two, so I was brought over to California. And, okay, and I grew up in California. Cool. Yeah, my brother grew up there as well. My my whole family's from St. Petersburg. Um, I was born in Rhode Island, so I'm kind of you know I'm the American here. Nice. But um, yeah. So I uh, got into entrepreneurship really early in my life. Never had a job. Uh, Kind of did all the like standard kid entrepreneurship stuff, selling stuff on Craigslist, um, selling water bottles, just like very standard uh, kind of like high school approach to business. Um, my first real business was in my early 20s. I got into e-commerce, uh, sold a variety of products on Amazon and private e-com sites, ended up going out to China to do some manufacturing work out there. Um, we built a product from scratch and then... I ended up in an IP lawsuit and kind of like lost that entire business in the span of two months. So that was my first real gut punch uh, in business. What were you making? So um, we, we were basically selling trending products. So the first thing that we sold was uh, the inflatable loungers. I don't know if you remember those. Um, oh, like the things like they, that, you, that you, yeah. Yeah, 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 I think I know yeah exactly. You like move um, around in the air and they form kind of like a tube and you can sit on the tube yep. there. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we sold those, and then we got into um, we got into the spinners. If you remember those, mm -hmm. uh, basically, I was just like scanning Google Trends and Kickstarter every day, looking for whatever was trending, and then I would just go on Alibaba and source it. So, um, but yeah, ended up going out to China, um, did some work out there, and then kind of like lost that business. And who sued you? What happened? Somebody like had a patent on on the fidget spinners or something? Uh, yeah, so. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what happened, but basically, uh, they, they didn't have a patent, but, um, they just had a lot more money than I did. And so my lawyer was like, we can fight this, but you know, you're going to be drowning in legal fees. And he was like, I think we can win, but you might as well just settle. So we just ended up settling and, and moving on. Yeah. But, um, because of our experience on Amazon and kind of understood like keyword research and organic growth stuff, SEO. And so we just decided to basically build out. A product for Amazon merchants. And so we started this company called Stack Influence, uh, bootstrapped it for like four and a half years, kind of like pounding our head against the wall, trying to find product market fit. Um, got it up to reasonable numbers and revenue and then kind of went out and started raising money from VCs. And I've, I've posted about this a little bit on Twitter, but for whatever reason, that just didn't scratch my itch. I didn't like the venture model, didn't want to just like raise money and then light it on fire and then raise more money and light it on fire again. And so um, I ended up stepping down from management, um, ended up investing in that company. The, the co-founders are like some of my best friends and they're still running that business today and it's, it's growing and doing really well. So I'm happy for them. Just kind of wasn't for me. And that business uh, connects influencers with people that have products on Amazon or something else. Yeah, correct. So the idea at the time was pretty novel. Now it's, now it's pretty common, but basically we took micro influencers instead of these kind of like bigger names. And the idea was that the engagement rates on these accounts were significantly higher because, you know, if you have a thousand or two thousand followers 
let's just throw out a number, 50% of those people either know you directly or they like know you through a friend of a friend, right? But when you take like a Kim Kardashian type person, you know, the engagement rate on five or six million followers is going to be like one or 2%. And so our idea was like, if we just take in aggregate 500, 1,000, 3,000 of these people that have 1,000 followers, you know, the total number of followers will be the same as the large influencer, but you're going to get a lot more out of, out of um, you know, your marketing spend there. And so, yeah, we, we basically would just like connect people that were looking for, you know, a, sh- a bottle of shampoo and then find like a DTC brand and, and basically, you know, middleman the operation or sorry, the transaction. Um, so yeah, uh, early 2021 ended up stepping down. My brother and I started lurking on Twitter, uh, kind of learning about the SMB space, uh, going on biz by sell, looking at a bunch of deals. We looked at laundromats and gas stations and liquor stores, just kind of like running the gambit. And then we we're actually very close to buying a vending business. We spent like a month driving around with this hilarious Russian guy. Um, and he, he like really wanted to sell to us, but then we were at the closing table basically like a week before and we requested, I think the total deal was like 220 K something like that. And we, we asked him to finance like 15 K out of, out of 220 and he refused. And like, he, he didn't, he didn't even say like, Oh, let's, let's finance 10 K of it. He was like, no zero. And so we just ended up backing out. And that was like a food vending machine business? Yeah. Yeah. Um, soda, snack, you know, typical vending route. So yeah. And then, then we stumbled upon this ATM deal. Obviously didn't know anything about the business. I met up with the seller and I convinced him to, to sell us a really small part of the deal. I was like, hey, why, why don't you just like piece off three locations to us? And he agreed to that, which was amazing. We kind of got this like low risk entry into the business, which, you know, I'm really, really grateful for. Um, and so we, we ran those three locations for, I don't know, five or six weeks. And it was just like, Hey, this, this is super straightforward. Um, margins are great. And so we just kind of started doubling down from there. We ended up making a second acquisition from that guy. And then we went through four more total. I've, I, so like some of the content that I've put out on Twitter, I've merged together acquisitions just because it was like easier to instead of like going to the granular details of like, Oh, this is actually two separate acquisitions that happened like one after the other. I just like piece them together. But, um, yeah, we, we essentially, we did five total. Um, and so, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how we went from, uh, the first three to, uh, just over a hundred. And I'm, I'm kind of out right now in the middle of the country trying to, uh, get this deal done that I've, I've been posting about in the last, uh, couple weeks. Uh, which will put us somewhere in the range of like 150 machines. Wow. Amazing. And what's kind of like the top line numbers, revenue, income? Yeah. Uh, so before this acquisition, we were floating right around 30K in top line per month, um, netting somewhere in the range of 14 to 15K on that. Um, after this is done, we'll probably be somewhere in the range of 40K and 18 to 19 um, the margin on this route is going to be lower because I have to outsource the vaulting because it's not local. Um, and so I don't know if you know how that works, but yeah. essentially you just Tell pay. Yeah, sure. So there are two different ways to outsource the vaulting in ATMs. You can either hire an armored truck company like Brinks or Loomis, uh, or you can find other ATM operators that are willing to vault the route because they may already have machines in that area. And it just makes sense for them to pop into another location and, and throw the cash in there. And so the going rate is a dollar per transaction. Um, so obviously that eats into the margins significantly. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're going to be essentially doing somewhere in the range of 3,500 to 4k a month in net off of this, this current one. Very cool. How'd you meet that first seller? The first one I found on biz by sell. Were you looking for ATMs or you were, you just had no idea you were kind of like wide funnel looking at a little bit of everything at the time. No, we, we were just kind of like looking at the SMB space in general. We didn't really care too much. Um, I mean, we, we did kind of want to lean towards uh, capital intensive businesses as opposed to labor intensive. I mean, like, I think a big part of the risk in SMBs, and you know the space way better than I do, um, but my from my perspective, like any business that has a lot of human capital involved has, you know, a higher risk of like some sort of um, 
like something going really wrong post acquisition because you know a key man leaves or whatever or you know so for, from our perspective anything that had like less involvement with humans was was better so yeah that's that's totally fair what do you so yeah. uh, you mentioned capital intensive one thing that I do wonder about is like the working capital and how that works in ATM so how much money does like a given ATM usually have in it? And when you buy the business, like does the seller leave that in as working capital at all? Or do you guys have to, do you guys buy like kind of like a box and you have to put up your own cash that people use? How does all that work? Yeah. So again, it just depends on whether you're loading the machines yourself or if you're outsourcing it. So what I, what I just explained about the vaulters in that scenario, they use their own cash. And so you, you kind of like free up that capital and you're able to go and acquire more machines or, you know, do, do whatever you want with it. But, um, the amount of cash that you need to load your own machines just depends kind of on two things. One, how much does the machine dispense on average per month? And then two, how often do you want to go load it? And so like the simplest example is the machine dispenses 10 grand a month. You want to go once a week, you need $2,500 to load that machine. And so you can kind of just like extrapolate from there. Is that kind of the average that you're seeing? Like if you're just at some random liquor store in a gas station, it's like $10,000 a month, an approximate value. Um, I'd say, I'd say that's pretty standard. Um, that's like a reasonably good location. The thing is that everyone has kind of different opinions in this business on what's a good location and what isn't because everyone has different approaches to pricing and surcharge and how much they pay their merchants. And so from my perspective, like 10 K a month, if it, if a machine dispens dispenses 10 K a month, it's, it's pretty good. Um, others may think that's too small. We have locations that dispense five or six grand a month. And because of the way we've structured the pricing, I think like those locations are great as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, what do you, what do you mean? How you guys, like, I guess when I've used an ATM, I just go there and I pay and it's like, it's $2 or $3 surcharge or in Vegas, it's like $20 cause it's crazy there. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are you, what's like your flexibility with price? I, I guess, what are your options? So when we made our first, uh, medium size acquisition, I think we were up to like 30 or so machines. We decided to start playing around with pricing and, um, the guy who sold it to us actually explained to us that. A lot of people in this business don't take advantage of variable pricing. And what that means is there are kind of two ways you can tell the machine to structure the, the surcharge. You can tell it, I just want to set a flat rate, which is what you're talking about, 2 or $3, which is like 80 to 90% of the machines across the country. What we do is we say, okay, we're going to set a floor surcharge of, let's say, $3 or 325 And as soon as 3% or 3.2%, whatever you want to set it to, exceeds that floor surcharge, I want you to charge the greater number. And so, um, that's what we've done on like 90 plus percent of our machines. Now we started testing that on like, you know, maybe two or three machines was, was our first test run. And essentially we made more money. The merchants made more money and you know, everyone was happy. And so we were like, okay, let's just start kind of like deploying this strategy across the whole fleet. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm alluding to really. Got it. Got it. And one thing that I've always been curious about is like international surcharges. Like when I'm in a different country and I use my debit card, you know, they, they have the ATM fee, they have like the international currency fee. How does that apply to you? If somebody from like France is visiting and they're using their French debit yeah. card. Uh, so this is going into the weeds a little bit, but there's this thing called DCC dynamic currency conversion. And, um, Essentially, it's like a program that you can just like turn on on your ATM. Most processors have this uh, option. And what really happens when somebody uses a foreign card is there's like the way that the interchange gets uh, paid out to the ATM operator can be like can be very much affected by what type of card is used. And so if you don't turn on DCC, you end up basically like giving up a bunch of the interchange on that transaction. And in some case, in some cases, even losing money on the transaction. And so um, I wouldn't say it is a material part of the business because like 95% of the transactions or more are, are local uh, or domestic. And so I wouldn't say I've like really nerded out. I'm like going into my transaction history and like looking, okay, I lost like six cents here and 15 cents there. 
Um, but we do turn on DCC on all our terminals and that just basically like gives you kind of blanket protection against, um, those, those types of transactions. Okay. I get it. So what's the partnership look like with the merchants? I guess the merchants, like the liquor store owner, is that, is that when you say merchant, is that what, what you mean? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, re- retail store owners. Yeah. Okay. And how much do they get paid? Or like, do you have to pay them up front? Do you pay them like a percentage of your sales? So it's entirely negotiable. Um, most people, most of the accounts that we've purchased had contracts that were signed six, seven, eight years ago. And so back then the standard was like 50 cents per transaction, 75 cents per transaction. Nowadays it's become more competitive. Merchants are demanding more. I know like in New York, people say to just like kind of avoid New York entirely because um, the competition is so steep there. Um, what I see kind of across the board is a dollar per transaction, maybe a dollar 25 seems pretty standard. Uh, we, we do have some locations where the merchants came to us and said, Hey, we want a 50, 50 split. Uh, and you just, you just kind of negotiate case by case. And how much does a machine cost to buy? Like if you weren't buying these locations, how much like, is it just a new de novo machine? Yeah. A uh, brand new one. Brand new Hyosung Halo 2, which is the machine that, that we use most often, uh, is like twenty three or 2400 at retail. We get a slight discount uh, from our processor and you know you, you, you pay some shipping fees and, and whatnot. So it sounds like you're, you were both like setting up de novo machines in new locations and buying other people's businesses. Is that right? Uh, yes, but much more focusing on buying than, than the other strategy. Uh, it... When you kind of like look on like a pure ROI basis, placing machines is better, but it's much slower. It's not nearly as scalable. And so, um, you know, I think most of the people that I've met in this business built the entire thing that way. You know, they just like place the machine here, there, and then like, you know, 18 years later, they wake up and they have 600 locations. Um, I'm trying to take a very different approach. And so, um, you know, I I have placed machines, but I I think like maybe six or seven locations total. Yeah, it's just, Maybe the sales process takes a long time. You have to like convince the owner, kind of negotiate the contract. Whereas like yeah. you could just buy five locations all at once, right? Yeah. One one big bottleneck in the sales process of placing new locations is that you can't really cold call. Uh, or at least I found it really difficult. Maybe somebody has pulled it off, but um you know, the store owners in a liquor store are very rarely in there. It's really hard to get to the owner. The cashier doesn't want to give you their phone number. None of these guys answer their emails. So like cold email campaigns probably not going to work. And so uh, you kind of have to like walk in, offer a machine. They tell you maybe you come back, you show like I probably showed up an average of six or seven times to the locations that I did place. And so, you know, that was in the beginning when I was loading the machines myself and I was just like on the street. I was like, ah, I might as well just walk into this place. But I mean, now I'm just not really going to go out and spend time on that. Yeah. Did you, did, did you ever like feel like it was dangerous to load the machines yourself? Cause you're just carrying around a bunch of cash. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's safe. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it definitely felt a little bit sketchy in the beginning, but I think I think the perceived risk of it is much higher than it is in reality. Um, you know, the fact is like when you walk, when you walk into a store to load a machine, you can be in and out of there in like 90 seconds. Um, people are very much consumed with whatever they're dealing with. So like, you know, a guy's just like looking at what beer he wants or which cigarettes he wants to buy, or he's talking to the local cashier that he's friendly with. And so I, I was definitely like looking over my shoulder a lot when I was doing it back then. and you know, month after month, I would just kind of like, I I slowly started to come to the realization that like these people are not really paying attention that much. And it would take a lot of agency and organization to be like, okay, this guy is the loader. That's the type of car he's driving. We need to like, you know, camp out here and wait for him to come next time. It has happened to many people for sure. And maybe I just got lucky. Um, But I also like removed myself from that situation pretty quickly. And the other thing is you get cash and transit insurance. And so, you know, if you get robbed, that's covered by insurance. If one of your employees steals the money, that's covered by insurance. And so, yeah, there, there are safeguards you can put in place. I'm just imagining you and your brother in like an armored vehicle with like uh, bulletproof vests and like he's carrying a shotgun and you've got like a briefcase with your handcuff to the briefcase. And then you guys go up to this machine and, but it doesn't yeah, sound, uh, I, 
it doesn't sound like that's the case. Yeah, no, we're uh, we're a couple of nerdy Jews, so no, we we didn't <laughs> we didn't do any of that. Is there a market for this? Like now that you're, I mean, you've been in it for a little while. You, you own an incredible number of machines. Are there brokers? Are there like marketplaces? Is there like a WhatsApp group for owners? Like how do you how do you find out about uh, people selling their ATM machines? Um, yeah, there there's these two brothers, John and Jeff Sosville, kind of have like somewhat of a monopoly on the ATM brokerage uh, space. Their website is atmbrokerage.com. Um, I've gotten friendly with them, really nice guys. Um, there's stuff on Biz Buy Sell. Other than that, it's just like I've, I've spent a, a ton of time just kind of like aggressively networking in the space. And so I've gone to all the conferences. Um, I've cold called a bunch of ATM operators just by like walking in and, and looking at the number on the machine and calling them up. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think it just takes time in the very beginning. <clears throat> all I could do is really go on atmbrokers.com and go on biz by sell. And like, you know, the, the, the compounding effects of my networking is just kind of starting to pay off and I get phone calls and texts from people now. And so I'm, I'm just trying to like keep playing that game and, and hopefully, uh, you know, get reward in the long run. What could I expect at a trade show for ATM owners? Like what's, what's going on there? What are people talking about? Well, I'm sure you've been to conferences before, right? For sure. Yeah. I, I've been to a yeah. bunch of conferences, software, hospitality, uh, yeah. HVAC, all types of stuff. So, I mean like the, the like breakout rooms and like the, you know, the lectures and stuff. I mean, they talk about all sorts of stuff, ATM security, uh, cash reconciliation, you know, how to manage your loaders. And then, you know, they try to pitch you all sorts of new products, like new different locks and uh, one-time code locks or whatever. There's like a million different things. Um, when you actually walk around like the expo hall, there's, you know, different types of safes and you'll see like jukebox guys there. And um, I don't know. I mean, it just, it's, it's very similar to every other conference where like everyone is really just there to kind of like network and talk and, um, you know, I don't know how much actually gets done, but yeah. That's fascinating. I love trade shows. I get such a kick out of industry specific trade shows. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. I learn so much. I like learn about businesses I've never heard of. Um, and it's just like, a, it's a business nerds paradise. At least that's it how is. I feel about it. it uh, is, yeah. Who are like the big players in this industry that you kind of look up to? Um like, is there somebody with thousands of machines? Like, are there people that have been rolling these up or rolling or just like building them themselves for the last 20 years? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the processor that we use, uh, PAI, Payment Alliance International, they were bought out by Brinks uh, for, I want to say like $220 million uh, a couple of years ago. Obviously, there's a bunch of synergy between the two businesses. So I think, you know, they, the acquisition made sense for them. Uh, they started out as a regular ATM operator. I don't know what their like original core team was, but I assume it was just a few guys. Um, they now have, I want to say like a hundred thousand terminals. They had, they have a really, really big business. Yeah. Um, there are definitely other the ISOs. They're called independent sales organizations. There are definitely a bunch of other ISOs that have five, eight, nine, fifteen thousand machines. Um, so. I don't know if I necessarily look up to those people. Um, I'd say like the one guy that I really look up to in the space, I don't know him well at all. I just met him at a conference and had like a 45 minute conversation with him. And I was like, this guy is, you know, really, really smart. But um, he, he started out with one concession stand when he was 17 years old. Uh, he's like 36 now. And just like brick by brick placed ATMs and has 1800 locations now. And he cash loads 900 of them just him and his partner uh, which i like don't i don't even like understand how that's possible um but yeah he he was a really really cool guy super down to earth um so i, I don't know i i don't know if i like look up to these kind of like faceless uh corporations but um yeah there, there are definitely some big players in the space how many transactions a month do you see at your machines on average, but per location or total? Across yeah, the yeah, yeah. Per location, I'd say. So it's tough because there's total transactions and then there's withdrawal transactions. And whenever I talk, whenever I talk on Twitter, I 
I, about it, I usually mention total transactions because that's the number that you get your interchange off of. And so for example, like if somebody puts in a card and enters the wrong pin, that's a denied transaction, but that still counts towards your total. And, um, same as like if they have insufficient funds or if they just do like a balance inquiry, like all of these count as transactions and you collect interchange off them. I assume you're asking about actual withdrawal transactions. And so, um, on, I think so. Cause that's where you make most of your money, right? That's like where people pay the two fifty or $3. Yeah. I would, I would say like the average terminal probably does 70 to a hundred transactions, uh, per month. Again, this is like, this is very much specific to my fleet because you could talk to other guys where all of their machines do 300 transactions a month. They don't even touch anything less than that. Um, you know, some guys have like 500 locations and they're all strip clubs and like strip clubs do a thousand transactions a month. So it's, it, it varies widely. Yeah. So this guy that you were talking about, like if he has 1800 machines and he's doing about a hundred transactions a month and each withdrawal is $3 to him, then he's got about 550 K of revenue a month. And maybe that's like a 50%. Uh, net margin to him. So he's, he's cash flowing like a few million dollars a year. Does that sound, is that kind of how you think about it as well? Yeah, I think that's like a rough guess. I, I, I would assume it's a little bit less than that um, at scale. I don't know if you can do 50%, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's cash flowing a considerable number. That's for sure. I think I noticed on your Twitter, you said you, you mentioned how much you paid for one of them. I think it was like three times last year's cash flow, right? income that the person was making? Is that, is that about right for, for machines that you buy? I, I have made purchases at that price. Um, now we're trying to pay less than that. And um, yeah, the first guy that, that we purchased from, really funny character. Uh, he, <laughs> he ended up like being this type of guy that kind of like nickel and dimes and, and tries to like take advantage of newbies in the business. And then, you know, I, I wouldn't say we were like scammed in any way. Uh, but we definitely overpaid. And like, as we learned more about the business, we realized like, you, you know, you shouldn't really be paying three times cash flow. Um, especially because what happens is people list their business as if like they, they list the numbers as if they're loading everything themselves. And so if you're going to buy one of these businesses and outsource the vaulting, you're not going to be making that number that they're showing you. And so, um, I think there's like a, big, uh, there's a big difference that you need to pay attention to between cash flow if you're vaulting in-house versus cash flow if you're outsourcing the vaulting. Yeah, that's a great observation. That's something we learned along the way too, is when you're buying these SMBs, they're largely operated by the owner. And, you know, you can't even really like replace the owner's salary because they're doing five people's jobs. So if you just right. put one GM salary for them, it's not going to work out. Um, so you have to be really careful because, you know, you may need to double your costs. You may need like three employees to replace the owner at some point. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting observation for sure. Uh, what's your, like, what's your vision here? What's your long-term goal or short-term goal? How are you thinking about this business? And, and congrats, man. Like, it's so amazing what you've done. How old are you? 30. 30. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. You have over 100 machines already and it's been like a year and a half. Um, what are you up to? Like, where are you headed? I think a big part of the reason why we've been able to grow quickly in this industry is because, uh, a ton of the other players in this, in this space are kind of like blue collar entrepreneurs. Um, these like really hardworking immigrant guys that, um, did, did a really good job, like going out and like pounding the pavement or whatever you want to call it. But never really took advantage of any of the like financial, uh, you know, instruments that they have at their disposal in America, like leverage and, and using debt. And so um, my vision is to just basically raise a ton of money and go out and make these, these acquisitions and, um, you know, just kind of like take over these routes that have been mismanaged in a way and not mismanaged, meaning like they're um, falling apart or anything. It's just like people leave a lot of money on the table. And so, um, yeah, I wrote about this recently, but like we, we, and I got like a, <laughs> I got like bashed on Twitter for this, but like we bought a route from a guy who basically told us like, don't raise prices. You're going to ruin the business. 
And then, um, you know, I was like, sure, no problem. Like you won't be held responsible. And then we raised prices and nothing happened. We just made more money. And everyone on Twitter was like, you didn't keep your word. And I'm like, well, I don't even know what you're talking about really. But anyway, um, so yeah, I think there's a ton of opportunity to just kind of like deploy capital into these routes that um, are first of all, underpriced already. And then second of all, even more underpriced when you take into account the fact that you can raise prices and, and just, you know, get that margin expansion there. Yeah, the Twitter mob is uh, is dangerous. you got to watch out. It's a lot of people that have never bought an ATM machine that feel very <laughs> yeah. strongly about your business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, very cool. So you don't you don't have like, uh, hey, like at five years, we want to be at a thousand machines and I want to flip this for X millions of dollars and go do something else or how are you thinking about it? In the beginning of this year, so like every everything I've told you so far has been just me and my brother. We we had an LLC together. Uh, in the beginning of this year, we put together a holding company with kind of like a core set of capital partners that we met on Twitter. Um, and so the idea is to go out and basically make bigger and bigger acquisitions and just have like SPV LLCs under it for, for each one. Um, the, the like ambitious goal is to roll it up to 10 million in EBITDA and then, you know, an exit would be awesome. I don't know how realistic that is because I don't know how private equity looks at the ATM industry. And like, I don't really, you know, I don't have deep connections in that world. And so, um, if that happens, that'd be fantastic. And who knows what, you know, what will transpire over the next like 12, 24, 36 months. But, um, yeah, I think even like our, you know, even our like B scenario where we don't exit, I think like you could just continue to harvest the cash flow for, for a very long time. And, um, you can, you can put systems in place where, you know, it's never going to be like passive income because that just doesn't really exist in business. But like it, you know, more or less you can be like an absentee owner or whatever. And it, it is pretty much hands off once you outsource the vaulting and you have like a good office admin that takes the phone calls from merchants and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, I think, I, I think our vision is you, you mentioned number of machines. Like that's always tricky because again, like you could have a thousand machines that each do 40 transactions per month. Or you could have 400 machines that just do like 800 transactions per month. And so um, the number of machines doesn't really matter too much. I just like try to look at the EBITDA number. Um, sorry, I lost it there for a sec. But um, yeah, I, I, think, I think 10 million um, in EBITDA is, is a pretty large number. And I think it can be done. But um, realistically, if we land anywhere in like the 6 or 7 million a year, uh, range. I, I think that would be a fantastic outcome. I'm always interested in, in different holding companies and how people finance their journeys. Can you talk a little bit about where you guys ended up, how investors are participating, um, and yeah, and what you're doing for capital nowadays? Sure. Um, so back in the fall, we kind of tapped out the amount of money we were willing to put in ourselves. And so we went out and started raising money. Um, we raised exclusively within our network, people we had worked with in the past. And, uh, you know, because the returns are very strong in this business, selling equity is very, very expensive. And so uh, we decided to just basically sell purely debt. Um, so we put together a promissory note with our lawyer and um, raised just about half a million dollars uh, selling those. We didn't, we raised half a million in commitments. We didn't actually come for all of it in draws. I think we ended up taking about 275. Um, now what we're doing is um, very similar. Also just debt. We, we wanted to initially put in some like warrant coverage or something similar to that where we kind of like offer, you know, half a percent or 1% in equity for every, let's just say 50K that you put into a specific deal. Um, and so, yeah, we we basically pay like we, we have an AMR schedule um, and we pay like two years interest only and then straight line for the rest. Or we do like a mortgage style amortization there. We have, we have a bunch of flexibility in, in the, the actual structure of the debt because um, it doesn't really affect our numbers too much. And so, you know, I kind of make an initial pitch and, and, you know, if an investor push back, pushes back on it and says, Hey, you know, we'd like to make 14 and a half percent. And I want you to do like a mortgage style, uh, amortization from day one. Like we're, we're cool with that as well. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's how we've been raising money, um, up until now. 
I think like, unfortunately, a lot of the people that I, I talk to off of Twitter will, will are very much accustomed to the like GPLP model, like basically what like Huber's built and you know, what, what's very standard in the PE space. Um, and I, I say, unfortunately, because like, I, I really want to do that, but I understand that the startup costs and the annual management fees of running something like that are quite high. And so unless we're able to raise and deploy, I don't know, let's say like 20 or $30 million, it just kind of doesn't make sense. And so, um, we're just trying to take like incremental steps up the ladder and like, you know, use our own money and then show a track record and then raise some debt and do it again. And then do it like a slightly bigger acquisition. And then eventually once we have like enough proof that we are good operators and good stewards of capital or whatever you want to call it, um, then I'd like to go out and, and raise a fund and, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be tunnel vision on ATMs. I think people have like a ton of perceived risk from the outside of like, what's going to happen to cash. And like, is this going to be around in like six or seven years? And I have a ton of thoughts on that as well. Um, but, uh, there are a ton of like adjacent industries that I think you could basically recreate this model with like jukeboxes, pool tables, the claw, um, you know, there, there's like a ton of stuff out there that I don't think is going anywhere for a very long time. Yeah. A couple thoughts on that. Um, I'm a, like, I believe very strongly that people accelerate like how fast important oh, yeah. trends are going to go away. Oh yeah. Uh, like I think about the fax industry a lot, you know, you're like, you can send an email, you can do a phone call, you can send a text message, you can do WhatsApp, like who's even buying a fax anymore. And if you like, look it up, the numbers are huge. It's like a multi-billion dollar, I think like a $6 billion yeah. industry. Um, so I'm with you. I agree. Somebody was talking to me about cash ATMs the other day and they were worried about, Oh, maybe cash is going away. And I was like, no, like if you pay the right price, you'll get your money out. And I bet it'll be decades before like cash is truly gone. You'll just keep making more money and more money and more money. And it's going to be a perfectly good investment. Um, I mean, so I'm with you for sure. Well, yeah. What else do you think on that? Well, I was going to say pe people have a way of like making these big claims. And then when you ask them like, why, like what's, what's your reasoning or like, what, you know, and they don't really have a good answer. And the reality is like, if you go and you look at, I, I, I'm, this is the second time I mentioned Google trends on this call. Like I, I love Google trends. It's, it's, it's like one of my favorite things to nerd out on. But if you go and you look at like keywords, like cash ATM near me, um, you know, like ATM, like any of those, anything related to ATMs, the graph is just up and to the right for the last 20 years. Um, and then you can pin it against like, you know, crypto or, or Bitcoin ATM. And it's just like, you, you basically, you look at the graph and it's like, when there's a bull run in crypto, like the search volume goes up and then like, you know, the whole thing crashes and like everyone just cares about cash again. And so, yeah, I've looked at data from the Fed. Like the Fed has this, uh, this Fred graph called um, currency in circulation. And it's like the amount of physical currency in circulation. And it's like, it's like an exponential graph. It's like every year there's just like more and more cash in the streets. Um, and so I have a really hard time believing that any of this is going away in the next, like, you know, it, because people try to make claims like, oh, like five, six years, cash is going to be dead. It's like, that's impossible. It seems impossible to me. Um, and, and I try to draw parallels to like the payphone industry, right? You look at payphones in like early 2000s, 2001, 2002, cell phones were already out, but it was another like 10, 11 years until the industry fully died. And that's cell phones, which are arguably like the most disruptive technology of all time, right? And like, where is the evidence that that version, like the cell phone example in ATMs, like where, where is that? I, I, I don't see any sort of disruptive technology. And if we did see it today, I would still think that ATMs would be here for another 10 years at the minimum. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my thesis. I just looked it up. Payphones in the US in 2015 made $286 million. <laughs> I mean, that's it's astounding. Yeah, it's absurd. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, another comment is I really appreciate that you guys are taking incremental steps in this journey. Like you used your own money, you're using debt, you're maximizing your own equity and control in this. I oftentimes feel like people, new entrepreneurs will rush their journey. They'll get in kind of over their skis and they'll say, let's raise all this money and bring in all these smart investors and like 
they give up control, they give up equity in their company. And everywhere I've, I've looked, kind of like all the research that I've done, every entrepreneur I've talked to, the ones that kind of are a little bit slower in the first three to five years, 10 years from now, um, end up making out way better than the people who, you know, maybe started slow, but then in the second year, they raised a bunch of LP capital and had to deploy it. Um, so I appreciate how you guys are going about it. I think it's, I think it's the right way to do it. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's nice hearing that from you. What do you, what do you think about the Bitcoin ATMs? Do you see yourself buying any of those? Um, yeah, the problem is that <clears throat> the, the majority of the, the like, geographic areas where ATMs, regular ATMs do really well are not very conducive to, to crypto transactions, meaning like, you know, these are kind of like socioeconomically depressed areas. And so, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not against them by any means, but in these like kind of online circles where people are talking about ATMs and Bitcoin ATMs, you see a lot of feedback of people like, wow, this was amazing in 2017 and this was amazing in 2020. But this is just like, I, I'm literally making $4 a month now. And so um, I think there's a lot more volatility and the cash flow is much more predictable in regular ATMs. And so because we're taking this like M&A approach, I would be really hesitant to buy a fleet of Bitcoin ATMs where I'm going to be looking at transaction data from like 2020 and 2021 in this massive bull run. And then now we're, you know, we're basically like bottoming out or whatever. Well, I mean, crypto's rebounding now, but whatever. You, 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 you get my point. Um, I think, I think it can be interesting. I think placing them would probably be better than buying them. But I'm just kind of shooting from the hip. I don't, I don't know for real. Yeah, I have a friend that works at a at a large Bitcoin ATM company, and this is for a different conversation. But it's 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 chaos. It's chaos running that business. It's it's really really hard. I, I believe it. I believe um, it for yeah. a variety of different reasons. Yeah. Um, Okay, talk to me a little bit about Twitter. So you and your brother start lurking in 2020. And at some point, I guess you start sharing your journey. Why are you doing it? Kind of what value have you seen so far? Yeah, um, well, first of all, just lurking on, on Twitter for a couple months, instantly I could even see just like sitting on the sidelines, people grow, like their accounts growing and just like seeing the value uh, that other people were getting out of it. So. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's why I started posting. I I'll let you and everyone who listens to this in on a little secret. Like I don't enjoy Twitter really at all. I, I it's really hard for me to like for whatever reason, I feel very it feels very cringy to me and so like I know you have to kind of like water down the information and you know, I've I've written stuff where I've like kind of nerded out and been like, "Oh, this is like this is really good information. It gets like two likes or whatever. And like, nobody cares about it. And then I write some stuff where I'm like, we're doing like 30 K in revenue and everyone's like, Oh my God. And so, um, that part of it, I don't enjoy, but, <clears throat> but I just know that like, uh, the networking is insane on there. And so, uh, that's, that's really why I'm focusing on it. Um, I, I posted a thread like very early on after we made our first acquisition and, um, my this guy was my friend now Q you probably know Quinn the the vending guy on Twitter maybe not mm -hmm. uh, yeah um he uh he like retweeted me or whatever when I had like seven followers and that thread just like got me my first like three or four hundred followers and I got a bunch of DMs out of it and that was like okay fine like it, it, when I like when I saw the results firsthand I was like okay now I need to focus on this and um yeah I, I just think there's like a ton of really, really smart people on there. Uh, there's a lot of access to capital. Uh, you can, you can learn from, from other people posting about, you know, them running their businesses. And so, yeah, I'm just, uh, just kind of trying to do my thing on there. I get it. I, uh, I hear you on the cringiness. I had an account for 10 years on Twitter before I like posted anything basically. And then similarly, I saw some of my friends growing and getting value from Twitter, raising money, meeting really interesting people that they would have never otherwise met. And I started posting and I'm not like, a, I'm not like, despite what you see today, I'm not a content creator. Like it's like totally foreign to me. I was yeah. raised uh, like Soviet Jewish people. They teach you to like not share your business, right? It's right. Like kind of the, it's yeah, really, exactly. It's like yeah. play your cards close to your chest. If anything's going well, like definitely don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, 
so it took a, it was kind of like pulling teeth for me, but I took little steps and I started posting and then I had a similar experience. A friend retweeted me. I got a bunch of followers and that started the flywheel because interesting people started DMing me. Other people started kind of commenting and my account started growing. Uh, but I agree with you. Like you have to be a little bit cringy because the, the world is so noisy and Twitter is so noisy. And I was actually talking about this with Nick Huber. You mentioned them earlier. He'll take one of my posts and he'll send it to me and he'll be like, this is great information, but like, you're not telling anybody why they should pay attention, you know, like open mm -hmm. with, Hey, I have a hundred million dollar business and here's like what I learned yeah. as opposed to like, here's what I learned. And that to me is a little cringy, but it's, it's unfortunately just kind of like what it takes to get people to slow down in their feed and, yeah. and read the information, which is, which is, I think otherwise helpful. Yeah. Um, Cool, man. Well, this has been great. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm glad that you're posting on Twitter because obviously that's how we met. I saw one of your threads like detailing how you bought a business, how much you paid, how you raised prices. And I thought that was super cool. So I reached out. Um, at some point, I'll do, uh, I'll do a thread on this, I think. Cool. Um, and then get it up on, on YouTube. Tell us, uh, like tell anybody who might be listening, where should they find you or do you have like any asks? Are you like looking to hire people? Are you looking to buy more machines? Are you looking for capital? No, I'm, uh, I, I don't have any asks. You can find me, uh, Mitchell underscore Sorkin on, uh, on Twitter. Um, if anyone ever wants to get into the ATM business, uh, I'm, I'm happy to help. I've done like over a hundred calls of people just like asking me questions on the phone and I don't charge for it or anything. And so, um, yeah, just trying to give back as much as possible because I've already gotten like a unbelievable amount of value out of Twitter. And so I kind of feel some sort of responsibility to give back in some way. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, if people want to invest with us, definitely DM me. Um, you know, we're, we're raising capital pretty aggressively. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my thing. I, I, I really appreciate you bringing me on. Um, and yeah, th this has been a ton of fun. Thanks, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Have a great day. All right. You as well. This episode of Boring Businesses. I'm your host, Sieva Kaczynski. Thank you for watching or listening today. Any resources we mentioned during the show, we'll make sure to link in the show notes or below the video. If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify, please leave me a review. It really helps me learn and it allows other people to discover the podcast as well. Thanks again. And make sure you hit the subscribe or follow button if you haven't already. I'll see you next time.